The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Witt University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Kobus, there is a medical crisis going on in Africa today that is not COVID-19. And now everybody's attention right now is understandably on the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, this has affected all of our lives. Many of us are stuck at home. But at the end of the day, there are so many other things that are going on. And malaria is one of the topics that in so many ways has fallen off of the agenda, and it shouldn't. Uh, over 90% of malaria deaths occur in sub-Saharan Africa. And in most cases, the victims are children under the age of five years old. It's a sickness that claims 400,000 African lives every year. And what makes it so insidious right now is that many of the symptoms of malaria are the identical symptoms to COVID. So fever, achy bones, those flu-like symptoms. And what's happening now is that people are reluctant to go get treatment because they're afraid of the stigmatization that comes with maybe being uh, accused of having COVID. At the same time, people in hospitals are nervous about treating people with uh, COVID symptoms because they're not sure if they're going to get infected. And so it really is causing a big problem that a lot of the progress that has been made over the past 10 years in treating malaria in places like Africa and here in Southeast Asia as well are at risk of unraveling because of COVID-19. Now, this is interesting for our purposes in this discussion that malaria is one of the areas where the Chinese have actually had a, a lot of impact. And I say actually only because when it comes to large-scale health programs, that's not been the area of expertise for the Chinese for the most part. But on malaria, They've brought a lot of their own experience dealing with malaria in China over to Africa. So two main areas that they've been able to do things. One is they brought the cost of a lot of the medications down. So companies like Fosun, which is based in Shanghai, have sold hundreds of millions or at least millions of, of very low-cost malaria uh, medicines. They've also brought in low-cost nets and a lot of the supplies and a lot of the supplies that people like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who've also been dedicated to malaria, uh, use, they source a lot of that from China. And Cobus, there was a very controversial experiment in the Comoros Islands, which we're going to talk about today, and then also some efforts in Kenya. We haven't seen too much in terms of these big health initiatives. And of course, all of that, like so much else, has been sidelined by COVID-19. Yes, and but at the same time, there's a lot we can learn from these malaria initiatives when we look at COVID-19, particularly once there is a vaccine available, because there's there's a whole bunch of questions that are going to have to be answered about about the, the specifics of the vaccine, but then also about who the vaccine should be administered to. You know, should, like are we talking about entire populations or are we talking about people people at in risk groups? Um, this is also an issue that that really comes up in relation to rural versus urban populations. So, you know, kind of when we look at, at Chinese malaria efforts in places like the, like the Comoros, the, you know, kind of we can directly take these lessons and apply them to COVID as well. Now, when you look at Chinese media's coverage of what happened in the Comoros Islands, it is a paradise of joy, success. Everything was wonderful and great. When you look at some of the other coverage, it gets a little more complicated and nuanced. Uh, we had the privilege of featuring an article on our website uh, this fall, uh, Combating Malaria in the Comoros Islands, How China Almost Got It Right. And I love that word, almost. It was written by Esther Ajari, who's the founder and director of uh, Triatin, a youth-led nonprofit promoting health equity in Africa. She's also a final year student in medical and surgical studies at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. Uh, back in 2018, she was a Yali Fellow in West Africa. That's the prestigious U.S. government Young African Leaders Initiative Program. And she was also a Wells Mountain Scholar. Uh, we are so thrilled to have you on the program today, Esther. Thank you so much for joining us from your hometown in Ogara in the Southern Delta State. Thank you very much for having me. So talk to us a little bit about the research that you did on what the Chinese did in, in the Comoros Islands and why you said they almost got it right. 
Um, okay, so I started getting interested in the topic of malaria when one of my professors said um, we should stop trying. Malaria is not going anywhere in Africa. We're going to have it in the end of time. And I was like, that's not right, because definitely there are bigger issues that we've been able to eradicate, issues of um, smallpox, of rinder pest disease and all of that. So I started doing like um, minute research every day, trying to see, are we getting anywhere with the malaria vaccine? Is there any progress somewhere in any part of Africa where people have been able to like do an impactful project? So um, I came across the Comoros the story about the Comoros Island where China decided to like do a large scale project in the Comoros and they achieved amazing results. But um, when I started reading about this particular project, I realized that most of the um, articles on it came from the China media, the Chinese media. So I thought, okay, this is just like a one-sided narrative. Let's dig in. Let's ask people on the field, like, what happened? This project, did it achieve as much result as um, the Chinese media is saying? So um, I contacted a lot of people, like different people from my pair group to those working in the Ministry of Health and all of that. And I was able to get their contact through several programs I've been on. So it's very good to network, just in case you were wondering. And um, when I discussed with them, I realized that something about the project is that it actually changed the landscape of malaria prevention on the island. It's just that so many people still have some misgivings about the um, project, majorly because of the drug of choice, which is Atequik a drug um, manufactured by a Chinese company called New South. So um, I just realized that um, since malaria could have been eradicated from the Moeli and Ajoan islands of the Comoros, then it means it's possible for other parts of Africa to like um, follow in the footsteps and do the same thing about malaria. So I was really happy. And throughout the research period, I just like, I was so happy. I was like, yes, I proved my professor wrong. There's something out there. And um, so about <laughs> and the malaria thingy is just that um, so many people believe that malaria is going to like last for the end of time. It's not just my professor, like people I talked to, they were like, although China was able to get it right, right in quote, at this point in time, then it, it doesn't mean that it wouldn't come back. We are still very skeptical. We are still waiting for when malaria decides to visit our island. And although you try to convince them that it's possible to actually eradicate the disease, they, they, they are not convinced yet. They are already in tune with having malaria in their island. I feel so difference not to have malaria. So um, China did a great job, I would say that. But I think there's so much room for improvement, especially because um, the Comoros is a secluded island, so population movement can be controlled. But in places like Kenya, where the population is larger and um, you can't really monitor the population movement, you have to like do more. You have to like. Um, be willing to improve the FEMSEP project over and over again. So how did the Chinese effort actually work? You, you mentioned that, that Comoros, you know, has, you know, has, has several islands and um, and some of them are very secluded with, with not a lot of, of kind of cross travel. How did that play into how they actually rolled out this, this campaign? Okay, so basically the Chinese used an intervention method called the Mass Drug Administration, which is still very controversial among the scientific community. This is because um, everybody, regardless of their infection status, would receive a drug, which is um, a preventive chemotherapy drug. And in the case of this Chinese project, they used Atequik. So the only people that are spared from these interventions are like those that have serious contraindication to the drug. So um, using that, they, they believe that once they administer this drug to as many people as possible, preferably 95% of the population, the um, tendency of people developing the infection and transfer 
meeting it across is going to be reduced. So for the Comoros that has a very secluded island, um, they set up like malaria control stations in different districts, different counties, different villages to monitor uh, the movement of foreigners. So when you come into that country as a foreigner, they would ask you that they want to take like a test, a quick malaria test for you. And if you come at negative, then it's okay. You can travel to anywhere on the island and enjoy yourself. But if you come at like positive, then it means you have to take um, a drug, but if you don't agree to take that drug, which is the Atequik, you would have to go to um they have to go to the Ministry of Health to undergo some kind of due diligence. And most likely, according to the um, reports I got from the people I interviewed, you would most likely not be allowed to come into the island. Is that serious? Is that like mandatory for them? And the key thing about this project is that all stakeholders that were involved in implementing this project really believed in the work they were doing. You could hear the enthusiasm in their voice, the passion when you talk to them. And it really helped because once you are so passionate about your job, you wouldn't like want to, maybe you can't, nobody can bribe you. You cannot take like a bribe to allow that person enter into the island. So being able to like keep the outsiders out, although it's not all that diplomatic, but being able to do that is, was very, very crucial to achieving the success that they had in this project. It's funny because we talk about that, you know, from a couple of years ago, that was unthinkable to control the flow of people in and out of countries. And today, when there's no travel and borders are closed, it seems very normal and natural to do that for health reasons. Uh, you've brought up the point a couple of times now in your comments that the situation in Comoros is distinct from that of the rest of Africa. And at the same time, because of the movement of people, the isolation that it has as an island, and that what works in a small population off the coast of Africa will not work in Nigeria, Kenya, Malawi, these bigger populations where there's a lot more diversity and it's much more difficult to track the movement of people. So with that in mind, we get that, that it's an island. What are the lessons that you think can be extracted from the experience in the Comoros that could be applied by the Chinese or anybody else into mainland Africa. Okay, so the very first lesson I noticed when I was trying to piece the article together is that you have to have community mobilization. So you can't decide that you want to do a grand scale project in any part of Africa and not get the religious leaders, the cultural leaders, those people that people look up to um, involved in the project. So because this project achieved so many sources because we had like, I, I think the project had 4,100 full-time village volunteers, those people that decided, oh, enough is enough, we're going to deal with malaria, I'll put everything I have to do on hold and just volunteer my time with the project. So community mobilization is a key thing. Most projects that I've read about, they just come in thinking, oh, I'm here to do good, um, people would accept us regardless of what we do, so let's just do the good. They don't go around, they don't educate the masses, they don't want um allow people buy into this idea but china got it right when they did that because they allowed people like understand this project this is what we're trying to do this is how we hope to achieve it would you join us so community mobilization is a big thing not just for health projects, but for really any development project you want to do in any parts of Africa. I can't say about the rest of the world, but I know that Africans are so in tune with what their religious leaders want to say, have to say, what their community leaders have to say, even their peer groups. And it's so important that um, I mentioned that China also like had the help of several nonprofit organizations. For example, the Red Cross, the uh, Women Human Rights Organization, and even the Women Lega Aids center in the Comoros, those people, their conventional like interventions does not really revolve around, around malaria, but they decided this project is timely. Malaria is killing our people. Let's buy into this idea. Let's work with China. Let's try to do good for our community. So that's the first thing I would say. Every project across Africa should really utilize community mobilization. And the second thing I would say is that um, 
there should be international stakeholder collaboration because you'd see pieces criticizing this um, Chinese project and they are majorly from the WHO, the World Health Organization. And I think this is because, number one, China did not really collaborate with the WHO on this project. So, um, for example, I'm going to quote one WHO official that said, um, the evaluation and monitoring method of this Chinese project is very crude and insensitive. That's a comment that can throw off support from different international stakeholders, like the WHO is saying this. But if they had like partnered with the WHO, just like the way they partnered with the community and religious leaders, they could have achieved something great. So um, I think the Chinese is learning a lot from the um, FEMSA project, because now they are working on schistosomiasis um, in Zanzibar, they were working on it, and they had a tripartite agreement with the WHO, just trying to bring this um, number one health organization in the entire world together with them, because they have the expertise, they have the materials, the technological um, advancements that they need. So um, that's something that most projects should learn about. They should partner with international stakeholders. And one more lesson I can really point out there is that every project should be flexible enough to adapt to situations. Because when the Chinese medical team came to the Comoros, they didn't expect that they would not stay for too long. Because um, normally, when they go to different other countries, mostly the countries they can that speak English and they understand English and all of that, they always like stay for maybe two years, three years, and more. But for the Comoros, they had like just 18 months, according to like one of the people I interviewed. They stayed there for 18 months, and the Chinese medical team had to pass the baton to like um, the local health officials. They didn't plan for this. They thought we are going to deploy people there to help this situation. And after it's done, our people can come back to us. But they had to leave halfway because of the entire situation. Number one, they had this language barrier that was a big problem for them. Like they could not understand what the local population is say saying. And this can cause boredom and all of that. And also, um, the living condition in the Comoros and in China is different. So basically, it's like saying that, do you want to live in a least developed country, or do you want to stay in a developed one. So most of the Chinese medical teams were not all that enthusiastic, so they had to go back. So adapting in the middle of the project is just amazing. China had to do that. It was really, really great. So and um, one more thing before I end, I'm going to talk about the thing that caused the controversy in the entire project, majorly because um, the local population was not made aware of the fact that Atequik, the drug of choice, has not yet received the WHO prerequisite certification. So for those that don't understand what that means, is basically like a badge of approval saying that this drug is OK for large scale use. And nowadays, most international drug procur uh, procurement agencies are requiring that certification before they can purchase the drugs. But China did not receive that, although they had um, approval from the local FDA, like the Comoros FDA. So um, not telling the population that, not being transparent with them that, oh, we are yet to receive the PQ certification, but your FDA has um, approved our drugs to be good and safe and efficacious. That was like a turn off for most people that I interviewed. That's pretty sketchy. That That is very, very sketchy. And Cobus, it reminds me a little bit of what's going on right now in China, that they are using uh, COVID-19 vaccines that have yet to complete phase three clinical trials. Also in the United Arab Emirates, they're doing uh, using Chinese vaccines as well, even though they haven't completed the process. So there is some precedent for that. It's, it seems interesting. But boy, that Cobus, that does seem... That confirms a lot of the worst suspicions about some of the Chinese in terms of what they do in these kinds of situations. Yeah, I mean, you know, kind of it, it doesn't look good. We, we should also say that that uh, as far as I've read, um, President Donald Trump has been injected with with untested or, or you know, kind of with, with um, let's say, kind of with drugs that are in early phases of testing, um, you know, and, and haven't been cleared by, by similar bodies. So, you know, so I think COVID is, is really kind of... You know, 
providing a new lens, you know, I think for looking looking at this issue. Um, Esther, in, in terms of that cert certification, um, do, do you have any idea of why they moved ahead, you know, with with using this before it was certified, or more specifically, what was holding back the certification at the World Health Organization? Okay, so. Um I, we did a survey of 26 stakeholders from China, and we asked them, why don't you always try to get the WHO um, PQ certification? And the um, common thread between all their response is that they are most likely not that aware of the process it takes, number one. Number two is expensive. Like, the money you can use, the funds you'd use to, like, implement the project on different, like, islands, different places, you'd have to use that to try to get a certification. And the third reason they gave is that um, there is no way to appeal the decision. Like, it's so much better to not, like, um, even go through the process of obtaining the certification than go through the process and get rejected. So that rejection um, badge is really bad for their brand. So, and one more thing I have to state clear for the um, audience is that the PQ certification really does not, it's not meant to supplant the um, approval by the Federal Drug and um, Food and Drug Administration of the country. Basically, it was just a thing that they started for international drug procure procurement agencies. So uh, it wasn't really like um, if you don't get the PQ certification, it means your drug is not safe. That's not correct. It's it's just that. You, um, if you want international stakeholders to purchase your drug as a pharmaceutical company, you have to have that certification. So China moving on with the drug without the PQ certification might be due to the fact that um, it's expensive, like I said, and they just think, oh, we've gotten approval that we actually need, which is like this is the approval we need for the um, project. So why waste further time? Why waste further money to like um, do it? And according to um, some background Grand news I heard, I'm not exactly sure, but they said the um, Comoros government was in support. They understood that um, China does not have the PQ certification, but they were willing to like try because malaria is so much bigger than you can picture unless you stay on the island. So I think that's the reason they did that. Now, is there some merit to their argument? Okay, so I said it may be sketchy. Okay, because it doesn't give the confidence that the WHO has validated it. But at the same time, affordability and accessibility to these drugs is really, really important. And so is there, would you agree that there is some merit to maybe saying, listen, we're not trying to sell Artequick to, to Pfizer or to other international brands. We're just trying to distribute this into the Comoros and other places. So if we get the FDA approval in the Comoros, then maybe it's fine that we don't get the WHO PQ. Is there, is, do you think there's reason to that? I, yeah, of course, I actually agree with them. Like, if I was in the position of power to make those decisions, I would, because it does, like, like I said, is I just believe the WHO PQ certification really is a disadvantage to boarding pharmaceutical companies. And considering that uh, malaria accounts for thousands of deaths in the Comoros, going through the process, which is going to take a long time to get that certification, is going to result in more people dying. So if I'm speaking, I might be speaking from a very sentimental um, part of my heart because I'm really interested in work surrounding disease that kills people. So um, if I'm speaking from that part, I would say it's really good what they did. But if I'm speaking from the scientific mind that I have, I would say they should have waited. So I'm kind of not sure. I think I would leave for the, um, the viewers or the listeners to decide on this particular topic because they actually did a lot of good regardless of the certification. So speaking of, of the, the results of it, like, you know, how successful was it actually in, maintain, in, in uh, mitigating malaria? And then also, did, were, were there actually large-scale reports of, of side effects to the drug? For the success, because the Comoros has three islands. One is Moeli, the smallest one. Then there's Ajo one, and then there is um, the Grand Comore. So for the two smallest islands, Moeli and Ajo one, they were able to eradicate the disease completely from those islands by 2014. The project started in 2007, so they had seven years of trying, and then they finally achieved their goal. But for the Grand Comore, with a large population, they were able to decrease 
the prevalence, like really decrease it, that in 2016 it was reported that there was only 1,600 and something cases of malaria on that particular island. If I'm, I'm saying 1,000 something, people would be like, oh, that's a lot of number. But it's not actually considering that thousands used to be like the prevalence before um, this project happened. So although like the um, FEMSA project still went on in Grand Comoré, there's no recent data available to show that, okay, now in 2020, what's the impact? I could not find any of such data and I really searched. So I'm thinking because if, um, if you look at the trend between how the prevalence was before the project started and how it started going down, you'd realize that that 1,600 and something cases might have maybe gone down by 50% by now. I can't be sure because there's no data. That's one thing the Chinese should work on to make their data available. And um, for the other question about side effects, so the Chinese researcher said that this drug, Atequik, should only cause um, side effects in 1% of the population that it is used on. But um, local health officials disagree because they say that um, after the first round of mass drug administration, the number of patients that came to the hospital doubled that week. So and I'm, I'm like, OK, um, you know this thing about um, Occam's razor that says the simplest explanation is the correct one. So I'm thinking, and most scientists think the same thing, that if we administer a drug, a new drug to a population, and all of a sudden something unprecedented happened by increasing the population of people in the hospital by times two, it means that it must have had something to do with this drug. And it simply means that the research provided by the Chinese expert might not be correct. And the Comoros government would, dis would beg to dis differ with me, because they said that that particular incident of people going to the hospital is due to the flu going around in the island. But I don't know how true that is. I wouldn't be able to tell. But I'm just stating the facts as plainly as I can. You know, in Africa, there is a long history of foreign drug companies and pharmaceutical companies coming to test medicines that have not been fully tested in the labs in Europe, the U.S., and elsewhere. So it's not surprising that people are skeptical when foreign drug companies and foreigners do want to come and say, we've got a new medication for you. We're hearing that a lot about the COVID-19 uh, vaccines, where people are reluctant to take some of them, and there's a skepticism. You said in your research that you encountered this this type of questioning about China's motives as well. In fact, one of the people you spoke with said that he warned his loved ones that he didn't want to be, quote, guinea pigs for China's unholy experiment. Talk to us a little bit about the skepticism that the Chinese encountered, because I'm also curious about that with regards to the COVID-19 vaccine that China's talking about bringing to Africa as well. Something you should know about Africans, we have this weird thing we say about Chinese products. We think they are inferior. Like, um, for example, my brother was joking with me this morning and saying that, stop using that your China phone, Jare. <laughs> Let me not speak Pigeon because most of the people can't understand. But what he was saying is that this Chinese product, because it's a phone I have, is inferior. I should go for the US product. And I'm like, you don't even know that China is very good with technology, but that's a thing most Africans most Africans have been in contact with have. They just have this notion in their mind that Chinese product is inferior. So um, in You have to tell your brother that the iPhone is made in China. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> So you see, like, I'm kind of not even aware of that fact. And so many Africans most likely would not be aware of that, too. So no, even coming as a Chinese company with your product, there's already this general skepticism, like, around, oh, wow, no. And then coupled with the fact that um, this COVID-19 issue, most people blame it on China, on some of the only, um, on only things, in quote, that they did in their country. So it's just like, it's it's. You can understand that. You can understand the angle that they are coming from. And speaking with that man about that issue, saying that he doesn't want his loved ones to be an only experiment, um, we, because we had this group call. It wasn't just him on the call. There were four other people. When he said that, everybody was like, yeah, we thought about it at some point, Chinese. And I just feel like the China, uh, China as a country should work on their um, public image regarding products. That's what I think. I don't know if I'm correct on this issue, but that's what I think. Because it's like 
all the people I spoke with, because after hearing that man say something like that, I kind of just asked the others, like on a different call, on a different day, did you at any point feel, I shouldn't take this drug? I shouldn't. And then they were like, yes. It was it was until after the Akomoros government took the drug, like the president himself took the drug by himself and it was publicized that they were like, okay, our president wouldn't take something that would hurt us, so let's take it. So um I just that's what I feel. China should work on their public image, is what I think. You know, as, as you pointed out, there's, there's, there were several kind of issues with this trial and, you know, um, you know, WHO certification and so on would definitely have been a good idea. Um, but in general, it sounded like in, in, in lots, in, in some cases, it got really significant success. Um, so do, do you foresee this, this kind of drug and then also this, this, this kind of methodology of, of this kind of mass drug um, administration actually being rolled out in other parts of Africa too? Yes, I do, actually, but um, they have to tweak the entire process. For example, in Kenya, most of the citizens are refusing to participate in the mass drug administration just because the people, like the drug administrators, come from the Chinese company, New South, that really manufactures that drug. So um, the question they keep asking, why does a Chinese company, like a pharmaceutical company, want to give us their products if they are not trying to penetrate the African market? So we don't want that. We already have drugs that we are like interested in using. So this is not really a community aid. It's just a way to sell their products. That's like one thing that is causing the backlash from most Kenyans that I know. And um, the thing is, what I would suggest for any any organization that would want to do a mass drug administration um, intervention in any part of Africa is that they should use independent health officials. They shouldn't use those officials from their company or like they shouldn't come as we are the company manufacturing, uh, manufacturing the drugs so we are going to give you to your people. They should use different set of people like work with the Ministry of Health just like the way the Chinese company did um, China did with um, the Comoros. They used an institution which is the Guando um, University of Chinese um, Medicine. So that's something I think would help. Number two, I actually believe that mass drug administration can be um, can become like a good way of eradicating the um, malaria from other parts of Africa if they combine it with vector control. Vector control is like um, the mosquito. So they should do that too as well with mosquito control as well as case by case management. That's what I believe. I feel like one aspect of um, intervention, one form of intervention would not be enough to like really er eradicate malaria from Africa. So if we're combining things, we should do um, mass drug administration, we should do malaria, um, mosquito control and case by case management. Also, I think more research should be done into like um, understanding if other drugs apart from Atequik can be um, an alternative to be used in this mass drug administration trial because several countries wouldn't want like Atequik because it has not received WHO PQ certification. So let's try other drugs that are already been certified. Can we use these drugs? Can it work? But one fear I have is that this drug is like um, it's a combination of artemisin and several other drugs. But artemisin is like the last line of defense we have against malaria in the world because it's a fourth generation drug. If you are a medical student or you are in the health field, you would understand what that means. So we've not yet discovered a fifth generation drug. So if our population starts um, developing Developing resistance to this drug is going to like be bad because a similar case happened um, in Cambodia, actually at the border area between Cambodia and Thailand. And this resistance I'm talking about has spread to other like five other countries across the Mekong River. So it's a problem that is real. It's not something that is imagined. Resistance can happen to that artemisin, which is like a very, very effective anti-malaria drugs. So we should do, like, scientists should do more research into that topic is what I have to say. So we started our conversation talking about the impact that COVID-19 is having on malaria mitigation efforts because the symptoms are very similar. The money is now 
going to malaria right now. I mean, some of the money has been held over from previous programs, but there's a concern about next year or the year after that these big malaria programs that have been funded very, very successfully up until now may have their funds diverted the same way that uh, HIV uh, money is now being diverted to COVID. So some of the PEPFAR money in South Africa, which is the U.S. government's aid programs, have been shifted to COVID-19. So your professor said, you know what, you're never going to beat malaria. We're potentially seeing, because of COVID-19, a rollback in the fight against malaria. What do you think needs to be done right now in the era of COVID-19, assuming that COVID-19 will be with us now for the next two or three years in Africa? It's going to be hard to get rid of it right away in six, nine months. So thinking about malaria and COVID-19 in the future, what do you think needs to be done? I think um, we should understand that COVID-19 might be the new, new disease in town, but is going to like um, we are going to develop a vaccine towards that particular disease. But if we neglect other diseases like HIV, malaria, all of that, we are going to find that when we come back to like okay, we want to address malaria again, we'll see that we've gone from maybe 50% success to like 10% success. So it really, I think um, every agency fighting towards like health promotion across the world, not just in Africa, should prioritize and should say, okay, COVID-19 is affecting us. We should like divert um, this amount of funds to COVID-19, but we should not like neglect malaria. So you can have like maybe 12 million euros and give 5 million to COVID-19 and keep 7 million for malaria. Or I don't know how this um, sharing ratio would work, but every organization, every um, ministry across the world should realize that malaria has been here with us for lots of years. And most likely, if we don't do something about it, it's going to keep killing people up until like several decades from now. So I believe that funds should be like um, divided across these diseases. But some scientists would um, argue otherwise. They would say that all organizations previously um, tackling malaria should stay on tackling malaria. And those that new organizations that just sprung up to handle uh, COVID-19 should like just focus on COVID-19. I've read an article that actually said that. But I don't agree with that method because we really need all hands on deck to um, tackle COVID-19. So I believe that if an organization is really um, interested in pivoting to like other parts of like to COVID-19 from malaria um, control, they should should do that with um, malaria prevention and control still in their mind. They should divide their funds. That's what I think. The article is Combating Malaria in the Comoros Islands, How China Almost Got It Right. It's an excellent analysis of China's anti-malarial efforts in the Comoros that everybody should absolutely read. There's a lot of lessons from that article that apply to COVID-19 and also to the malaria fight elsewhere in Africa. It was written by Esther Ajari, who's the founder and director of Triatin, a youth-led nonprofit promoting health equity in Africa. She's also a final year student uh, in medical and surgical studies, so you know her life is so busy right now at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. Esther, I don't know how you have time to do it all, but we're just so grateful you squeezed a little bit of time for us to, to join us. Very quickly before you go, can you tell everybody about the work you're doing with Triatin? Okay, so um, the Triactin is like um, a passionate project I started when I was 19. And I really like think that project is important in Africa because there are so many neglected health issues that needs to be tackled, especially those that affect women directly. So I do work in the sexual and reproductive health field and in childhood malnutrition and diarrhea field. But recently, we've started writing different articles, doing a lot of research regarding neglected health issues and those health issues in countries with low research and um, um, advocacy outputs. So um, this particular project we did with malaria in the Comoros is very important to us because we've been thinking, let's do work on malaria. And we had the opportunity to do that in collaboration with the China Africa project. So uh, we, are, we have a lot of diseases in our mind that we think we should tackle a lot of countries, especially those in the least developed um, nations um, division. So that's what we do. We just like want to know more about these issues and spread the awareness across all of Africa. And if people want to follow the work that you are doing and Triatin is doing, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Um, they should just check out our website. It's, the tri it's triatin.org.ng. And you're also on Twitter, right? 
Yes, of course, Esther Ajari, Esther underscore Ajari. Okay, I'll have links to both the website and to Esther's Twitter feed uh, in the show notes. Esther, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it, and congratulations on all the amazing work you're doing, and best of luck, of course, in your last year of medical school. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you, Kobus. Kobus, there's so much to digest. My head is spinning after that conversation because she just was overflowing with, a, with good information Let's kind of focus on the problems first, and then we'll get to the good stuff. The problems that the Chinese encountered in Comoros sound like so many of the problems that they deal with elsewhere in their China-Africa engagement. Transparency, credibility, communication, all of that accountability, opacity. These are the same issues that we run into with the Chinese when it comes to debt, when it comes into products, and the, the poorly made in China, that whole narrative, all of that played out in the Comoro silence. And I think her point is really interesting, is that underneath all of these negative perceptions that people had, there was a great program. It was a really, really effective program. But yet it was clouded in a lot of these other issues that are well within the control of the Chinese to do something about. Be more transparent. Get the certifications. If you can't get that certification, get another certification. Or explain in a very clear manner what you are doing and why you are doing it. To say that the Chinese across the board suck at doing that is an understatement, but it's something that I think really inhibits their ability to be as successful as this program was. Yes, and you know, kind of it, they, they, the Chinese in, in Africa face a uh, problem of narrative frequently. You know, they they're up against an established narrative, but it's frequently a really unfair one. Um, you know, because because obviously there are substandard Chinese products, but there's lots of different kinds of Chinese products, and you know, the, and many of the ones going to Africa are fine. So you know, so but but the narrative needs to be fought. Um, at the same time, I think one of one of the things that that is actually weirdly makes it diff- harder for for China and Africa sometimes is this kind of scope of the projects that they that they're willing to undertake. So you know the the like no one else is out there. You know of of, of Africa's health partners are like okay, we we're eradicating malaria from the Comoros completely. This is what we're doing. You know, so so in a way, like one also needs if one if one wants to take a big swing like that, which which is the kind of thing one needs to do in in, in moments like this, um, then you also need a way of of explaining exactly what that big swing is and why you're taking it and how it's going to work. Um, and I think in that case, you know, again, you know, communication and narrative has been has been a, a weak spot here. I guess we did a show on malaria, I think a year or two ago, and it was about the Comoros as well. I haven't seen a whole lot since then from the Chinese about whether or not they're expanding their their anti-malarial efforts to elsewhere in Africa. And again, that may be because it's not happening. It may be because their communication is terrible. Who knows? But it's interesting because I would like to see more transparent and more clear examples of how the Comoros experiment can be brought over into a much more complex social environment, say like in Kenya and elsewhere. And the whole idea that one company, New South, is behind it also, I think, is problematic as well. And that's a very poorly executed plan in a place like Kenya or elsewhere, where they do have a much more robust governance system, say, compared to the Comoros. Faulty as it may be in some areas, as we've seen with the PPE donations from the Chinese, but nonetheless, it's a bigger playground to be in. And they're going to have to change the approach. And so this idea that New South can come in and just be one brand selling Artiquick and and then expect everybody to line up is not going to work. What they should be doing is implementing a proper public health campaign where they're drawing on resources from lots of different countries. Maybe it's Indian pharmaceuticals, maybe it's Chinese pharmaceuticals, all kind of coming together, bringing in U.S., European expertise. Again, I know that won't happen in the current environment, but that would be the kind of thing that I think would go to allay some of the fears, reasonable fears, by the way, I think, when one company is selling a drug and managing the program at the same time, it kind of makes you think, well, maybe the Kenyans aren't wrong in thinking these guys really aren't interested in our health. They're more interested in selling a product. So it would be interesting, again, just to see if the Chinese can kind of bring that those lessons over into mainland Africa and adapt them for these more complex ecosystems. Yeah, because the thing is, if if one can make a dent in malaria, that would be a game changer. Like malaria is a consistent, like kind of nightmarish problem in Africa. And the problem is, once one has had malaria, then the malaria can come back. 
without without uh, you know having without being kind of stung by an infected mosquito again. It just it, it it remains in your system. Like friends of mine have had malaria several times after one infection. You know, so so it, it it's a it's this kind of insidious problem that keeps that keeps kind of pulling societies back from development, back from from progress. Um, and one should also keep in mind that sure, like they 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 had there's a very bad history of of kind of of untested drugs being used in Africa and kind of bad drug testing in Africa. That that is true. However, there's also a really bad record in Africa about you know people in the name of of avoiding side effects or you know that kind of 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 this uh, caution causing people to to or causing like very effective drugs to be withheld from large parts of of the population. We like in South Africa s- suffered thousands and thousands of deaths from HIV you know kind of while while the government was was you know kind of using a discourse of of concern about side effects you know it turns out you know there, there's a there's a major side effect to not taking HIV drugs too which is death you know so it's you know kind of it's you know that 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 itself is a is a kind of a balance like Africa has been badly treated in both directions not just in one direction so the the combination of although the, the like how to balance those is you know is, is is a kind of a wide conversation that needs to be held in Africa and beyond and it's important that we put some context here that while China has done this malaria initiative in the Comoros and I assume, I don't have the data in front of me, supports WHO efforts elsewhere in mitigating malaria on the continent. The United States actually is one of the major players uh, with the president's malaria initiative, PMI. Uh, They spend enormously on this, and they don't always get the credit for what they're spending, particularly in public health. So much of U.S. spending on public health in Africa has been normalized over the past 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You and I have talked about this quite a bit, Cobus, how nobody really appreciates that much anymore what the U.S. does, say, for example, PEPFAR in South Africa that has saved upwards of 11 million lives. But yet the Chinese will come in with a much smaller program like the Comoros program and get a disproportionate amount of tension. And to some extent, there is a little bit of that going on here as well. So I think it's important that we acknowledge the efforts of the United Nations, the president's malaria initiative out of the U.S. White House, also what the World Health Organizations and so many other countries are doing. We're just hoping that malaria will not get subsumed by COVID in part because of the stigmas. And again, the stigma is really, really important. It's also something that we see here in uh, in Vietnam. And it's, I think, universal that people are reluctant to go get medical treatment if they have the symptoms of COVID because they don't want to be the reason that an entire neighborhood gets shut down. So what's happening here, and it's also happening in Africa from what I've been reading, is people who have flu-like symptoms, which could be malaria, could be COVID, could just be a normal flu, are being sent to relatives in the countryside, for example. So that way they can ride out the, the, the illness there without compromising what's going on in the city. And that's very dangerous because either if you have COVID, it's going untreated, but if you have malaria, it's also going untreated. So there's a lot of complexities in the moment that we're in right now, and that's been part of the theme that we've been looking at all year. So great that we had Esther on to talk to us about uh, what she's kind of seeing in the research that she's doing and getting also that youth perspective on this very, very important issue. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. Uh, We cover these issues from health to COVID to trade and everything in our daily email newsletter. And if you like this deep dive that we did today with Esther, you'll absolutely love our daily email newsletter. We were so excited about the response that it's gotten from stakeholders in academia, diplomacy, business, and whatnot. We'd love for you to join. Please go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe, and you can sign up, and we have a special offer of $3 for three months just to try it out. Once again, chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. So that'll do it. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash chinaafricaproject to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.